I'm just going to go ahead and mute everybody just to start with, and then we can unmute you or uh, you can unmute to get going here. All right. Well, perfect, everybody. Here we are. Another week of the Colorado Legislative Session here. And we got a special guest tonight. So we're going to get started. We'll just give it just a minute uh, for any of you stragglers, anybody wanting to join. But please share this link. Every Sunday night, the Libertarian Party of Colorado and Free State Colorado uh, does a live stream here going over all the bills of the week, uh, giving you the opportunity, all the information you need to show up at the state capitol. Make your voice heard. we got to speak for pro-liberty pro bills, support our pro-liberty leaders down at the state capitol, and of course, you know, oppose the authoritarianism that they've been pushing on our state for so long. So we have some spe a special guest tonight. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. I'll just give them one more minute for everybody to join. But again, you can always check on Free State Colorado on YouTube every Sunday night at 7.30. We usually go till about 9, maybe end a little early if we are done talking about what we we're talking about, or maybe go a little bit late. Uh, as the session goes, I'm sure we'll be uh, stretching the limits there. But my name is Brandon Wark, freestatecolorado.com. I'm with Michael Vance, uh, the Legislative Director of the Libertarian Party of Colorado. Michael, how are you this evening? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Very well. Thank you. Thank you. We've been getting some great feedback of these presentations we've been doing, really trying to empower the Liberty community here in Colorado with the information and the tools to make their voice heard at the state capitol. It's very, very easy. Colorado is one of the easiest states to, to make your voice heard. Show up at a committee hearing, speak truth to power, talk to these legislators, tell them how wrong they are. You know, it's really, you'd be 10 feet away from a, a communist, some, you know, communist state legislator, tell them how wrong they are, look them in the eyes. It's extremely empowering. These people are passing some bad legislation and they need to hear from the public. And of course, on the flip side, we do have some pro-liberty leaders down there. We're actually going to talk about some really good bills this week, surprisingly, and, uh, you know, show up and support those bills speak out and uh, make our voices heard. So this is the fifth week of the 2024 legislative session. Uh, we're really getting ramped up. For those who don't know, the Colorado General Assembly meets from January 10th to May 8th this year. And tonight we're going to do it a little different, um, not doing as many of the uh, slides. We're going to actually be using the legislative website to show people uh, how easy it is to track this legislation, to get in there and take a look at it. But we do have a special guest tonight. We actually have uh, Ian Escalante from Rocky Mount Gun Owners, who's going to be talking about some of this anti-gun legislation that actually is going to be heard this week in committee. So we're really hoping the pro-gun, pro-liberty community shows up in force at the state capitol this week during these committee hearings to tell them, you know, defend our gun rights. Do not pass anti-gun legislation. So I'm going to turn it over to Ian here. Uh, uh, I can unmute you here, there, and uh, we'll go to rmgo.org. For if you're not a member, please join rmgo.org. It's our Colorado's pro gun organization fighting for us down at the state capitol. You can actually go to uh, looking at the firearms bill watch under gun laws, gun laws bill watch. And every year, RMGO does a great job of tracking all the anti-gun legislation and even pro-gun legislation and giving you uh, e easy way to find out what's going on at the state capitol. So, uh, Ian, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We'll go ahead and give you the floor. Ian's going to talk about the gun bills, and then we'll get into our regularly scheduled program of going over every committee hearing for this uh, legislative week. Awesome. Well, uh, first off, can you hear me okay, Brandon? Perfect. Well, I want to thank Brandon and Free State Colorado for letting me come on here and speak to all of you. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, gun rights or founding fathers you know, talked about it in countless papers and countless documents. Some of our, our founding documents, our first state constitutions like Virginia and even the Colorado Constitution have delineated the importance of the right to bear arms. Our founding fathers believed, as I believe, that the right to bear arms is the last line of defense that us as the people, as the citizens of Colorado, as the citizens of the United States have against the hard tyranny that our founding fathers fought against in England. Um, and unfortunately, we see the Democrats uh, wielding an extreme amount of power, more power than they ever have since the state is founded. And one of the things they are doing, one of the first things that Democrats do when they come, for, to, come to power is they start coming after your guns. Um, that is something we have seen them do in California. We've seen them do it in New York. Uh, more recently, we've seen them do it in Washington and Illinois, and they really want to add 
Colorado to that list. So I want to talk about the two gun bills that are going to be heard this week. Uh, one of them will be heard tomorrow. One of them will be heard on Thursday. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the gun laws that will be coming here in the next couple of weeks that you all need to keep an eye on. So firstly, um, tomorrow, uh, I'm sure many of you probably follow the RMGO Twitter page. If you do not, please do. It's at RMGO Colorado. Um, we post constant updates there on you know, our legislative session, on our lawsuits, on elections, uh, any sort of gun news you need here in the state of Colorado, you can find the most accurate, up-to-date news at RMGO Colorado's Twitter page. Um, for those of you who have not seen our Twitter page, we have our first gun control bill hearing tomorrow. This is going to be the first of many, unfortunately, that we are going to see this session. Tomorrow's hearing will be in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and it's going to be House Bill 24003. Um, and I call it, uh, kind of nicknamed it the CBI Gestapo bill. Uh, what it does is it gives a lot of uh, a lot more appropriation, about $1.7 million to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation for the sole purpose of investigating what they call, quote unquote, illegal firearm activity, right? Now, an amendment that's being pushed by the governor's office and the Colorado Bureau of Investigation is set to be filed tomorrow in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, right now, as it stands, the bill language is very, very uh, open-ended, very loose, doesn't really define anything. Well, the amendment that I uh, got to see this past week that will be filed tomorrow in Judiciary Committee is going to actually delineate and instruct the Colorado Bureau of Investigation to investigate your local gun shop to make sure that they are abiding by the universal background check law, the three-day minimum waiting period, which uh, RMGO currently has a lawsuit against right now, and additionally, the uh, magazine ban that was passed in 2018, the standard capacity magazine ban, and the ghost gun ban. Uh, both of those bills, RMGO has active lawsuits on them. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to empower these Colorado Bureau of Investigation agents. They're going to hire about 10 or 11 new field agents, and they're going to turn them loose on our local gun shops across the state to harass them, to investigate them uh, with little to no probable cause. The, uh, the language of this bill says that they can launch an investigation based off of a verbal tip. So if some crazy blue haired communist says, you know, Triple J Armory, is selling 50 round magazines and you need to investigate them, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation can initiate that investigation without approval from the district attorney, without approval from the county sheriff's office, and additionally with no probable cause other than a verbal tip. So this is a serious, serious constitutional violation. It violates both the U.S. Constitution, uh, the Fourth Amendment, uh, as well as the Colorado State Constitution. So this is a very, very dangerous bill, and this is going to be laying the groundwork for enforcement of a lot of the other garbage that we're going to see coming down the pipe this session, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, it is very, very important that we go after and stop this bill right in its tracks. Um, it's going to a committee tomorrow, the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, which is currently has three Democrats, two Republicans on it. The two Republicans are likely to be solid on this issue. Um, we have two Democrats that are Metro Democrats. They're hardcore leftists. And then we have Senator Dylan Roberts, who's a moderate Democrat from Steamboat Springs out in the Western Slope. Um, his district has a lot of gun owners. He has previously voted right uh, and voted against some of the gun control that's come down the pipe here in the past. Um, we've been putting an obscene amount of pressure on him. Hopefully the pressure can make him turn against this bill, vote against it, and kill it in committee. The reason why this bill is so important to be stopped is because this is the beginning of the enforcement mechanism for every other bill that they're going to try to ram down our throats this session, and also for all the other unconstitutional gun control that they have already passed here in the last 10 to 11 years. Stopping this is going to be vital to making sure that if some of these bills are passed, if unfortunately we are not able to stop um, some of the bills that I'll talk about later uh, that are going to be huge infringements, we will at least be able to have some of the sheriffs be able to stand up and say, no, we're not enforcing it. Um, with this CBI bill, this would give CBI purview over these laws, transfer enforcement of these laws to CBI, override the county sheriffs, and pretty much make Colorado Bureau of Investigation um, 
Jared Polis's henchmen enforcers. That's really what it's going to come down to. Hence the term that I uh, dubbed the bill, the CBI Gestapo bill. It's going to turn the Colorado Bureau of Investigation into a Gestapo-like enforcement force of the governor's office with little to no checks or oversight. That is extremely dangerous. Uh, I will personally be on site at the Capitol tomorrow, along with a plethora of other Rocky Mountain Gun Owners fans um, and members. And what I really want to do is I want to get, for those of you that are watching this stream right now, I want to get as many of you out to this test to this hearing tomorrow so we can all testify against this bill and show a show of force against this tyranny. Uh, we all know that Moms Demand Action and the Bloomberg people and every town are going to show up in their red shirts in force. They're going to scream and cry about how many children die and they're going to make use fake statistics um, about quote unquote gun violence. And they're going to try to manipulate and throw a fit and, you know, cry their way to forcing these legislators to pass this bill. We cannot let this happen. This will be, as I said before, the groundwork of enforcement for every other gun control bill that they want to pass this session. Um, real quick, what I want to do is I want to kind of lay out to you what our plan is going to be for tomorrow. Um, for those of you who are on here and want to you know, get off the couch and stand up and testify against this tomorrow, um, go to the Colorado uh, General Assembly website. So that's ledge.colorado.gov. You can see it up in the corner on Brandon's screen. What you're going to do is you're going to click on the menu with all the options there over on the top right, um, and you're going to select the committees option. Right there, you're going to go to the committees page and you're going to see that button there that says public testimony. What you're going to do is you're going to click on that and you're going to go through a very, very quick process of putting in your information. If you don't feel like driving all the way out to Denver, you can testify via Zoom. It is a lot better, though, if we have people in person. You're going to go there. You're going to sign up. You're going to select the committee, which is the Senate Judiciary Committee. You're going to select the time, which is going to be uh, February 5th at 1.30 p.m. And you're going to select the bill, which is Senate Bill 24003. It was the third bill that was filed in this session, just to give you an idea of how serious the Democrats are at extincting the Second Amendment in our state. We need people out there and we need to show a strong show of force against this legislation. It is so incredibly important. So please, if you're able to show up at the Capitol tomorrow, um, I ask that everyone, if you're going to come show up at 1 p.m., I will be standing inside the Capitol waiting for people right past the security checkpoint on the north entrance to the Capitol. That is the Colfax entrance. That is the main entrance that faces Colfax and 16th Street Mall. That's where I will be meeting everyone tomorrow at 1 p.m. The hearing starts at 1.30 and it will be the first bill on the docket. So make sure you are there on time. That way you can go ahead and testify in a timely manner. I do want to forewarn everyone. Colorado is one of the few states where after your testimony is done, the legislators are allowed to cross-examine you and ask you questions. Be prepared for the more radical anti-gun members on this committee to try to harass you, to try to provoke you. Are you, you. going to the uh, judiciary tomorrow to listen? I'm going to email right now. Yes, yes I will thing. be going to judiciary tomorrow. So these people may try to agitate you. They may try to get you to say something you know, off the wall that the reporters can eat up and put you on the front page of the Denver Post or CPR or the Colorado Sun. Be prepared for that. Stay calm, cool, and collected. Hit them with facts and do not allow them to get under your skin. So that's going to be awesome. the first hearing of this week. Um, Brandon, if you want, I'll go ahead and get into the second hearing of the second bill that will be heard this week. Um, and then I can go ahead and talk about what we're going to be seeing here in the next couple of weeks. Definitely. Just to reiterate, and thank you, Ian, for that. Yeah, show up at the state capitol if you can. That's where you can have the biggest impact is actually being down there. Look these legislators in the eye. Look Tom Sullivan, make Frillich, look at them in the eye and tell them they're wrong to try and infringe on our rights. They're wrong to create this government bureaucracy to go after gun owners and gun stores. Show up there, meet your pro-gun people, uh, pro-gun community. Meet Ian down there at one o'clock at the state capitol. And show up at the judiciary hearing and make your voice heard. As Ian said, if you cannot make it, 
uh, in person, you can go to the committee's website here, just showing this one more time to make it easy for people. Click on public testimony. You can do it over Zoom. You can testify over Zoom and you can submit written testimony. Your top priority would be there in person. Second would be to be in Zoom and you could always submit written testimony, but uh, really being down there is your, your big key. So yes, Ian, thank you. Let's uh, go ahead and move on to the next anti-gun bill of the week. Yeah, and I want to reiterate to those watching right now that, you know, as bad as these might seem, unfortunately, these are actually the least egregious of the bills that we are likely to see this session. So pay very close attention to these, um, and I will get into more of what we are going to see down the line after I go over this next bill. Perfect. So the second bill that's going to be heard this week is another Tom Sullivan bill. Surprise, surprise. I don't think uh, there is any bill that grossly expands the role of government and infringes on people's rights that does not carry Tom Sullivan's name on it. So it's no surprise here that he is filing yet another gun control bill. This bill is Senate Bill uh, 2466 which is going to be a backdoor gun registry bill. What it's going to do is it's going to require the credit card processing companies like Wells Fargo, Visa, MasterCard, American Express to create a new SIC or SIC code. Uh, it's a merchant category code specifically for firearms. They also want to give the attorney general's office full access to it. What that means is that Phil Weiser's office, who's been very open about his hatred for the Second Amendment, he has called for universal background checks on ammunition and firearms accessories and even supported gun, full-blown gun confiscation. His office, this individual, will have full access and be able to track who is purchasing firearms. This is very, very bad. On top of that, it carries penalties for gun shops who do not implement updated credit card processors with the new SIC code to be able to track these gun purchases. Um, the fines range from anywhere from about five to $10,000 per offense. So if you commit multiple offenses, these gun shops could be forking out 30 or 40 grand um, for all of the offenses across the board if they end up on the wrong side of the attorney general's office. So this is another incredibly dangerous bill. Now this bill is going to be going to the, uh, Business, Labor, and Technology Committee, uh, and this one's going to be on Thursday, February 8th. Um, this bill is also going to be extremely, extremely important to stop because, again, this is backdoor gun registry. They're going to try to sell it as something different. They're going to try to say, listen, you know, we want to go ahead and be able to track these purchases because if a criminal goes and buys a weapon and they shoot and kill someone, we want to be able to know what gun shop they purchased it from. This, do not let them lie to you, this is backdoor gun registry. They will be able to see every single person in the state who not only purchases firearms, you know, you can buy a gun and yeah, it will be under that code, but if you purchase ammunition, if you purchase magazines, if you purchase anything of the sort, for example, these bills are going to all kind of tie together. Um, if, for example, the CBI bill passes and this uh, uh, gun registry bill passes, the attorney general's office could then go look at all the credit card codes, see who has purchased magazines, and then what would happen is they could send CBI to that gun shop to make sure the person did not purchase a magazine over 15 rounds. This is all one big intertwined thread of cracking down and harassing gun shops and gun owners across the state. The goal of all these bills is to turn the Colorado Bureau of Investigation into Colorado's ATF. That is extremely, extremely dangerous. We all know what the ATF is capable of. We saw what they did in Waco. We see what they do to gun shops every day. We see what they've done to regular law-abiding citizens, uh, turning them into criminals overnight, whether it be pistol braces or forced reset triggers. Um, we do not want a statewide ATF in the state of Colorado. I cannot stress that to the viewers enough. So that's going to be extremely, extremely important. Uh, if you want to sign up to testify against this bill, uh, you're going to go ahead and follow the same procedure. You're going to go to the Colorado General Assembly website. You're going to click on committees. You're going to go to public testimony. And this time you will be signing up for the Business, Labor, and Technology Committee meeting on February 8th, 
that we'll hear Senate Bill 2466. Uh, the difference, though, between this one and the House Judiciary, or sorry, Senate Judiciary Committee that's going on tomorrow is that they will be meeting upon adjournment. So there's no real set time that this committee will be meeting. Upon adjournment means they go into session at nine o'clock. The Senate goes, they hear bills, they do appointments, they pass resolutions, uh, and then they adjourn. And directly after that adjournment, they're going to go straight into the Business, Labor, and Technology Committee. So for that, those of you that want to uh, sign up and testify, uh, the procedure will be exactly the same. Meet me at the north entrance of the Capitol. That is the Colfax entrance. But this time, I'm going to need everyone to be there by 9.15, 9.30 at the latest. Sometimes these morning Senate sessions can last 20 minutes or they can last two hours. And we don't. We want to make sure if they do have a short session, and they tend to have short sessions on heavy committee days, which Thursdays are their heavy committee days, uh, we don't want to be caught flat-footed or miss the hearing altogether. So I ask that anyone that it wants to show up and testify against this gun registry bill, show up at the Capitol, 915 North Entrance. So that is all I got as far as the bills going on this week. Um, Brandon, I'm going to go ahead and get into what we're going to be seeing coming down the line here in the next couple of weeks, and we will go ahead and get back to regularly scheduled programming. Awesome, Andy. I really appreciate you. I'll be down there Thursday as well. So 915 uh, Thursday at the State Capitol, we'll be uh, live tweeting it down there uh it's in the old supreme court room which is uh really easy to find it's really right right next to the uh house chamber basically on that uh second floor there so very easy to get to i uh, hope to see you down there on thursday this is a horrific bill combining the two bills together ian i'm really glad you made that connection between giving the cbi more money and then giving them more power to basically create this new system but yeah We'll go to rmgo.org. Uh, like I said before, become a member if you're not. They're a great organization. They're actually fighting for us down at the state capitol, protecting our gun rights. You can go to gun laws, bill watch, rmgo.org slash bill watch uh, to see all the bills. But Ian, if you have a couple more minutes, we really appreciate you going over uh, some of these other bills that are going to be uh, announced this year. Yes. So unfortunately, I uh, woke up this morning. You know, I'm trying to enjoy the beautiful cloudless day. After it, you know, dumped a four feet of snow yesterday and I'm trying to go out on my porch and enjoy a nice, you know, pretty day before I have to go into the uh, the Denver swamp for uh, another week in a row. And I saw one of our life members of RMGO sent me a news article from the Denver Post that came out this morning. Uh, and it's very disturbing. And the headline is, is gun control no longer electoral kryptonite for Democrats. And pretty much what the entire point of this article it was trying to get across is the Democrats no longer fear that they will get backlash from Colorado voters over them passing gun control, which is a very, very bad thing. Um, one thing that RMGO teaches in our political schools is the number one weapon you can use against any politician, Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Libertarian, whatever. They're voting against your rights, okay? The biggest thing you can do is threaten their reelection. They need to fear the voters. If these politicians fear the voters, they will think twice before trampling all over their rights. Uh, the Denver uh, Democrats, the Colorado Democrat caucus in both the House and the Senate, uh, more the House so than the Senate, uh, has pretty much said we don't care. We don't really care anymore what the voters think. We want to do this, so we're going to do it, and you guys are just going to have to suck it up. In this article, they lay out a plethora of bills that we are going to see that either have been filed over the weekend or that we are going to see here in the next couple of weeks. A lot of them we have actually uh, had forethought on. We had a good feeling that these bills were coming. So we went ahead and pre-uploaded them to our website. So when we do eventually see them, you can get the bill numbers, the sponsors, where the bill is, the status, everything across the board. Um, the biggest one they're going to be pushing is for the assault weapons ban. So that will be a ban on all semi-automatic rifles in the state of Colorado. And if this bill looks anything like the bill that was filed last year, which we were fortunately able to defeat, um, this will include a ban on all semi-automatic firearms with detachable magazines. So pretty much that would, across the board, ban most conventionally owned firearms, that would ban most pistols, that would ban all rifles, all semi-automatic rifles. 
Um, they also want to ban the 50 caliber bullet. Um, and in some of the drafts of the bill that came out last year, there was even a gun confiscation clause in there. So where they were going to send the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, again, to Brandon's point, tying back to the CBI bill that's being heard tomorrow, they want to send the Colorado Bureau of Investigation door to door to people's houses. I mean, this is Nazi Germany type of stuff. They want to turn the CBI into their own personal SS, their own personal KGB, to send them door to door to confiscate these weapons, to go into people's houses, to investigate, to see if they hold any of these types of weapons. And unless they went ahead and did a Form 4 registration with the ATF, so that would be um, the type of registration that you would do for a suppressor or any other NFA regulated devices, SBRs, things of that nature, you would have to nationally register that firearm um, or get an FFL license uh, or they, you would be required by law to surrender that firearm to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. They would then have, you would then have three days to prove that either you purchased this weapon before the, uh, before the assault weapons ban went into effect. So that means you would need a receipt. You would need some sort of hard proof that you purchased it before it went into effect. And if you could not provide that within three business days, you could be charged with up to a class five felony um, with a massive fine and your weapon would be confiscated and destroyed. This is what this assault weapons ban is going to look like. Denver Post already said this is very likely going to be a ripoff of the Illinois and Washington state assault weapons bans, which by all intenses of the word bans most conventionally owned firearms in both of those states. It is almost impossible to purchase a gun in Illinois now um, as it is in Washington. So they really want to cram this garbage down our throats. Other things that they are going to try to push for, and we are all going to see these bills filed in probably the next 10 days. So um, you will probably see me on here again in the next couple of weeks talking about the onslaught of horrible gun control bills that we have hearings for in the next few weeks. Um, require creating a new state permit for gun shops um, along. So now in addition to getting the FFL that you need federally, to be able to open a gun shop, you would need to get a state firearm, a uh, firearm merchant license. I don't know exactly what they're going to call it, but you would need a, an additional permit with regulation from CBI. Again, tying back into that bill that we're going to be seeing um, at the hearing tomorrow. Again, using CBI as the governor's personal enforcers of these gun control laws. You will have to go through CBI to get this permit to be able to even operate a gun shop. So now, on top of the several thousands of dollars that you have to get fork over to the ATF and the federal government just to maintain your FFL, you would now need to fork over a couple more thousand dollars to the state to maintain whatever they decide to call this stupid permit to be able to operate a gun shop. Um, that's going to be really bad. That is going to put a lot of your local gun shops out of business. Um, just last year, based off of the horrible bills we saw passed last year, I know of at least six gun shops across the state that have packed up and said, we're done with this. We can't handle the regulation. They're either closing up shop or they're moving to states like Oklahoma or Wyoming or Kansas or other states where they actually respect individual rights and at least somewhat respect the right to keep and bear arms. So that's another one that's going to be really bad. Um, we could, we're going to see a requirement for gun owners to carry liability insurance. So if you own a firearm now, you will like purchasing car insurance, you'll be required to purchase liability insurance. That way, if you shoot someone in defense of your own life or your own property, the family would be able to sue you and you would need that liability insurance to cover potential court losses or court fees and things like that. It's complete garbage. Um, permit to purchase is going to be another one that we're going to see, um, church carry ban. So you will no longer be allowed to carry a firearm to defend yourself in your places of worship. Uh, campus carry ban is going to be woven into that bill. And additionally, we're going to see a plethora of other new gun free zones created 
across the state to make it almost impossible to carry a firearm open or concealed except in extremely limited places is absolute garbage. This bill was actually passed in California and recently struck down. So the Colorado Democrats know full well that this bill is unconstitutional, but yet they're passing it anyway as kind of a, a thumb of the nose at gun owners of this state to say, listen, we know it's unconstitutional, but we really don't care. Screw you guys. Um, and that's the attitude of the Colorado Democrats right now. Again, another bill is going to be um, restricting concealed carry, creating new training requirements, creating a new uh, process for obtaining a concealed carry permit, which would include a live fire test, a written exam, and also require you to every couple years renew your concealed carry permit by passing another live fire test and another written exam. Now, Brandon, who do you think is going to be in charge of enforcing this wannabe law? Oh, I'm sure they would. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I would think the counties and the sheriffs because they're the ones who issue uh, the uh, con uh, concealed carry permits. However, I can imagine the CBI might try and take authority over uh, the counties in terms of these new requirements. That's exactly what's going to happen. CBI is going to be tasked with creating all of the new regulations and standards for getting a concealed carry permit. So they're going to be almost completely bypassing the sheriffs, which since the, our state was founded, the sheriffs have overseen the concealed carry permits, have overseen all that stuff, and it has been purposely kept from the state because of the fact that we need to make sure there is a check against a overreaching tyrannical state government, which, newsflash, we've had now for about five or six years. So that's going to be really bad. Again, tying that all back to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation bill that's going to be heard tomorrow. This is the groundwork for the enforcement of all these other laws. There's going to be other uh, bills that are going to show up. Um, we're also hearing that there might be a firearm owner ID card law showing up like they have in Illinois where you need a permit to purchase. Uh, you also need to pass background check for ammunition. Uh, a lot of that other just complete and total garbage um, that is going to really, really cause extinction level events on our gun rights in the Second Amendment here in Colorado. So I, I cannot emphasize enough, we need people showing up tomorrow to stop this CBI bill because without the enforcement mechanism, it will be a lot harder for these people to ram these other laws down our throat. This CBI bill will be used to enforce an assault weapons ban. The CBI bill will be forced, will be used to enforce the magazine ban, forcing uh, gun owners to carry liability insurance, church carry ban, every single horrible, awful bill that I've brought attention to in the last since i since this call has started since the stream has started this bill will be the mechanism for enforcement so i ask all of you to show up at the capitol tomorrow 1 p.m north entrance we're going to go to the senate judiciary committee like i said i'll be waiting there for people i will guide everyone to the old supreme court make sure we're all together make sure we're all on the same page here we need a show of force and also if these bills pass, they're going to have to be fought out in the courts. Um, we need gun rights lovers and supporters of the Second Amendment to donate to Rocky Mountain gun owners, specifically to donate to our legal fund. We have a lot of lawsuits going on right now. With the announcement of these new bills being filed, that number is only going to increase, and that is going to be a huge drain on our budget and on our finances. There is no other group in the state of Colorado that's actually doing the work to fight back against these kinds of bills. No other group that claims to be no compromise or pro 2A or any of that is actually taking the time to get involved here and fight back against this. Rocky Mountain Gun Owners is quite literally the last defense of the Second Amendment and gun rights in this state. So I ask you, please join RMGO, donate. Brandon, thank you so much for having me on tonight, and I'll see you all tomorrow at the Capitol hey, at 1 p.m. Hey, hey, Ian, got a quick yes. question for you. Uh, somebody in the YouTube uh, chat actually uh, referenced this. Uh, with the past year, uh, considering uh, SB 303, which turned into Prop HH, and how the Democrats whined and told us how we needed to take a bunch of money from uh, homeowners because – 
a lot of schools are underfunded, et cetera. They don't have enough money to do what they need to do, or at least that's how they that's what they claim. How are they able to fund all these uh, gun control bills? I mean, if they get these things passed, it's going to cost a lot of money for them to um, uh, enact what they're proposing. So, what's their what's their plan? I mean, because if they have, we already have what I believe are, I think it's sixteen percent of our state's gdp is debt so how are they gonna fund this is my question sure so one i'm not sure they can but what they're going to do is jared polis just signed that new earned income tax credit bill that they uh passed in the special session they had to redo it because there's some serious constitutional issues there that gives the state now access to reach into tabor refunds to our tabor refunds and distribute them however they see fit um, what we are going to see is as the government starts to run out of money by doing this, they're going to put more tax increases on the ballot. And the end goal here is that if they really want to be able to fund this to the extent that they you know, want to and are planning to, they're going to have to either get rid of Tabor or they're going to have to literally illegally and unconstitutionally reach into the Tabor fund and steal our hard-earned money to pay for this. That is the only possible way that they could do this. Um, there's a chance that they could get some federal assistance from the ATF with Biden in office. I'm not entirely sure how that's going to work. But, I mean, the end goal here, the, everything that, you know, you guys talk about on this call, from Tabor to Prop HH to gun rights to all of it, all of it ties together. They can't pay for all this garbage and they can't pay to enforce all this garbage unless they are have more money and they have access to the Tabor funds. So that's another reason why fighting back against their assault on Tabor is so important, which I'm sure you guys will cover later in this call, um, is so important because if they get their access to the Tabor refunds or they get rid of Tabor completely, all bets are off. They will throw this state into a mountain load of debt to enforce all of this garbage. Does that answer your question? It, it does. Thank you, Ian. No problem. Awesome. Well, Ian, really appreciate you. I know you're a busy guy, but uh, you have an open invitation every week. Uh, for those just joining us, the uh, Libertarian Party of Colorado and Free State Colorado host this legislative uh, preview of what's going to be on the week, trying to empower individuals, empower the liberty community to speak up, show up, and get involved. So, Ian, uh, we hope to talk to you again. Uh, please keep us updated. And like I said before, if you're not a member, please join Rocky Mountain Gun Owners, a wonderful organization. They're fighting in the courts. They're fighting at the Capitol. Uh, they're going to be fighting a lot, and they need the help. So rmgo.org and check out rmgo.org slash billwatch as well to keep a, an updated view there. So Ian, appreciate you. Everybody follow uh, Ian on Twitter as well, uh, and also uh, follow Rocky Mountain Gun Owners on Twitter. So thank you, Ian. Really appreciate your time. Feel free to stick on the call if you'd like. Of course. Well, thank you so much. And I see Mayor Lamb's on here, too. And uh, we got a plan to destroy the concealed carry ban in uh, Keensburg. So not all news is bad news. A lot of it is. But maybe in a couple of weeks here, we'll have some good news. Thank you so much, Brandon. I look forward awesome. to it, Ian. It's in the works. Awesome. You'll get some great liberty leaders on the call, including the uh, libertarian mayor of Keensburg, Aaron Lamb. Thank you for joining us. Lots of other people here. Uh, we're going to be having guests uh, throughout the legislative session on these calls. But we're going to go ahead and get back to our regularly scheduled program here. We're going to look at the schedule for the week. We're going to look at all the committee hearings, uh, talk about some of the key bills that you can speak out on. Uh, Ian talked about two anti-gun bills this week. We'll get in, We'll mention those again and then get into the rest of them as well. So uh, we're going to check out the legislative website. So this is a great resource for people out there. You can track all this legislation on your own, of course, but leg.colorado.gov. That's really where you want to go. So uh, if you open that up, it's a great website. This is going to be the place uh, where you're going to find everything. So looking at the schedule for the week, you can scroll down, uh, go down to, you can click on today's full schedule. We really just want to see the schedule for the week. Uh, this will show you the session schedule. Uh, make sure you always click on origin all for both house and Senate. And then obviously nothing today. It's Sunday, but we're going to go ahead and jump right into Monday. So uh, Michael here, we're going to take a look at the different uh, committees being heard this week. So starting tomorrow, 10 AM, the Senate and the house will convene and go over their uh, bills that have already been heard in committee or other house and Senate business. We won't get into the, the chamber as a whole, 
uh, because there's not really an opportunity for citizen input. It's the committees it's showing up at these committee hearings, these scheduled committee hearings where you can speak. You have usually three minutes to speak on behalf of, of your community, of a new organization you represent, and speak for or against any types of bills. And it's a really empowering, really important. So the first committee of the week will be tomorrow. Uh, we won't talk about the Joint Budget Committee. We'll jump right into the 1.30 p.m. The House to Agriculture, Water, and Natural Resources Committee at 1.30 p.m. Uh, some interest there. Uh, there's a veterinary technician scope of practice in providing veterinary services through telehealth. Not too exciting uh, bills there. However, uh, talking to another a Liberty leader here in Colorado, this veterinary technician scope of practice is actually a bad bill. So we, we heard from our MGO earlier. There's another great organization out there called, uh, called excuse me here, uh, Colorado Liberty Scorecard. So Colorado Liberty Scorecard, if you go to libertyscorecardco.us, a really great group. It's run by the Colorado Liberty Republicans, and they track legislation as well. You can actually go in and see all the 2024 bills that they rate. They go through, and it's a really wonderful resource. So if you're looking at a bill you you're, and want some more information on it, you can check out this website and uh, take a look at it there. So looking at that bill here, the let's see, what was it called here? The... 1047 veterinary scope of practice. Just uh, quickly here, looking at that. You scroll down to find that one. And they actually show that they oppose it on the basis of free markets, limited government, personal responsibility, that this bill actually creates unnecessary regulations on veterinarians and vet techs. So I don't, want to spend too, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this bill specifically, but I really wanted to point out that this Liberty Scorecard CO.us is really a great resource on pretty much all legislation out there. So that's the committee hearing, first committee hearing of the week tomorrow uh, down at the state capitol at 1.30 p.m. Uh, Michael, uh, would you like to talk about any of these? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have really a ton to say. I know we got a lot to get through, so... But, uh, yeah, I mean, we don't want to be uh, supporting additional regulations when uh, veterinarians uh, veterinarians have already gone through a, gone through enough to, you know, get into their practices, et cetera. So, I mean, uh, at a certain point, we need to let veteran veterinarians do what they do best. Gotcha. So anybody in, in the field, anybody interested, those two bills could be of interest to you if you are in the veterinary, uh, veterinary uh, industry there. So moving on, looking at the House Finance Committee tomorrow, let's check out their agenda here. Uh, some bills, multi-state tax filing system for insurance taxes, additional para-service retirees for schools, exemption for children's products, and a uh, updated abstract on property taxes. The last one should be very interesting. Uh, property taxes is one of the hottest political issues in Colorado right now. Uh, this next week or so, uh, Colorado homeowners and property owners are going to be shocked because the bills are in the mail. They're going to arrive and uh, skyrocketed bills are going to be really rough. So uh, keep an eye on what's going on with property taxes. Anything in this committee, Michael, you'd like to touch on? I don't really have a ton on this one. Perfect. Let's keep moving. Keep moving. So 1.30 p.m., the House State Civic Military and Affairs Committee. Uh, being heard tomorrow. That is generally considered the kill committee. However, they do have um, some good bills uh, that are heard there that do end up passed because that's uh, following through with the purview of that state civic military affairs issues. So one of the best bills of the week uh, that's going to be heard tomorrow, good pro-liberty bill, is from Representative Bockenfeld. So tomorrow, if you are down at the state capitol, you know, if you're speaking maybe on the gun bill, maybe that ends soon, you can go down over to LSBA, the Legislative Service Building, which is across the street. It's a different building than the state capitol, but just right across the street, it's the old state museum. You'll see it on the outside, say. And this House Bill 1026 is a great bill that would protect Colorado voters, uh, Colorado taxpayers' rights. It would reauthorize uh, taxpayer bill of rights, Tabor protections in communities that have given it up over the years. Uh, one of our Liberty leaders, Natalie Menton, and I did a video on this last week. Uh, it's really a great bill. Uh, unfortunately, I doubt that it's going to go anywhere, but another good bill to support uh, taxpayers in forcing local governments to ask a, for consent another time to retain excess revenue uh, beyond what Tabor allows them to do. So this would be a great bill. Uh, really good. I'd love to see people get down there and testify on this one. 
Perfect. So any uh, any word on this one, Michael? Uh, this is considered the kill committee, correct? Correct. So what are the odds this one gets approved, would you say? Uh, 99% odds that this bill will be killed by the Democratic majority. That's that's what I'm suspecting, too. But nonetheless, it's really important to go down there to still show up and speak out in support. Uh, you know, the representatives, the senators who are pushing pro-liberty bills need to hear from the people. And the bad guys, the authoritarian legislators need to know there's opposition. They need to know that they're being watched and that what they're doing is wrong and that people are willing to speak out about it. That is huge, especially in this important election year. You, that's a that's a good point considering how Democrats currently feel about gun rights uh, and thinking that it's no longer a, a problematic issue for them. So, yeah, we need to get down there and uh, uh, we need to put a uh, face in front of them that says, no, what you're doing is not right. And uh, we're going to we're going to stand up against this as, as the people of the state. Definitely. So a good pro-liberty bill being heard tomorrow at 1.30. It'd be great to see uh, any taxpayer advocates, anybody down there in support of that. Uh, the other bill being heard in the state civic and military affairs committee tomorrow is ballot access for candidates with disabilities. Uh, Representative Ortiz, uh, who is in a wheelchair, has been a champion for uh, you know uh, d people with disabilities. So um, probably a pretty innocuous bill on that one, I'd imagine. So that's tomorrow. Uh, at, at the same time as the Senate Education Committee. Let's take a look and see what they're talking about. So they'll be hearing three bills, remote testing and online education programs, seasonal outdoor adventure day cap program, and outdoor nature-based preschool programs. If you're in the education field, these might be of interest to you, but I don't think we're going to get into any of these. Looking at the Senate Judiciary Committee. So, of course, that's the one that Ian from Rocky Mountain Gun Owners was talking about. Uh, the agenda for that tomorrow. So it looks like they do have uh, four bills on the agenda. He thought maybe the gun bill might be the first one heard. It might be, um, but there are other bills that will be heard as well. Uh, privacy protections for criminal justice records, district attorney salaries. Uh, of course, they want to give them a raise. And then, of course, this really bad Colorado Bureau of Investigation authority to investigate firearms crimes and an enactment of Colorado Revised Statutes of 2023. So... Definitely, if you're down there, if you're able to show up at the state capitol or even provide testimony over Zoom, please, please show up and, and oppose Senate Bill 3. Anything else you'd like to talk about on this one, Michael? I don't have anything at this time. All right. So the last committee hearing tomorrow is the Senate Transportation and Energy Committee. Kind of ridiculous bill here, Senate Bill 32, methods to increase the use of transit. Uh, they want people on mass transit. They want people in high-density housing. They don't want people out there uh, living out in rural communities. So they're really pushing this use of transit. So uh, probably creating a committee or creating some sort of task force to try and figure out why people aren't taking dangerous and dirty RTD. And then vulnerable road user protection enterprise. So those are our two bills in the Transportation Energy and the Senate Committee tomorrow. All right. Anything else you'd like to talk about on Monday there, Michael, before we move on to Tuesday? I do want to say uh, there's a couple interesting bills on this day overall. So, well, yes, Ian talked about going out and helping, uh, uh, joining the fight with him personally down at the state capitol. If there are other bills that you want to speak out against, you can still speak to that committee via email and testimony. So you could potentially write an email about one bill and then go uh, meet and uh, – meet in person and testify on a different bill at the same exact time. So uh, that is an option. So that way you can get your voice heard on multiple different topics. Perfect. I just want to jump back to this slide here as well. Uh, we created uh, um, some bills of the week actually here. So one we didn't talk about is this exemption for children's products uh, that was in the house education committee. It should be, I believe, or if not, if I'm not mistaken, um, I could be mistaken there. So I apologize for that. Is under house finance. So this one bit, one last bill, I just wanted to double check on was this 1027, uh, kind of an interesting bill. Uh, they want to create a sales tax and use exemption for baby and toddler products. You know, I know a lot of liberty minded people do not like the idea of special carve outs for certain types of products or services. Um, but nonetheless, this would reduce 
taxes overall uh, for these products and reduce the tax burden on families. So probably a good bill, in my opinion, uh, from a libertarian perspective here. So the, unfortunately, they do create a uh, lot of bureaucracy around it in terms of a lot of little nuance and details, but nonetheless, uh, creating sales and use tax exemptions for local communities, as well as the state for some of these different things, these baby and toddler products, you know, could be could be a good thing, right? You know, it's a pro-family bill, I suppose. Any thoughts on this one? Nothing new to add. Perfect. So those would be uh, what I would say some of the three bills of the week tomorrow. So that's going to be at the uh, Senate Finance Committee hearing as well, or House Finance, excuse me. Yeah, House Finance, House Committee Room 112, uh, also at 1.30 tomorrow. So three bills being heard at 1.30 tomorrow, uh, two pro-taxpayer bills, and one anti-gun bill. So those are kind of the three bills for tomorrow that we are watching. Uh, let's go to move on to Tuesday. So Tuesday, the House Appropriations Committee has an early start to the day, 7.30. They have until 9 o'clock when the, when the House convenes to basically go through and uh, approve all these supplemental uh, bills for, for the appropriations. So a lot going on there. Definitely not going to get into these. I imagine they're going to fly through all of these uh, supplemental appropriations. Then the House and the Senate will convene at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. And then at 1.30, the House and Human Services Committee. You can show up and testify there if you'd like. Uh, it's some more presentations, actually. So some sunset review hearings. So some of these bills that may be passed in previous years uh, are going to sunset. So they're allowing the legislators to decide if these bills should continue on or go ahead and sunset. So that will be in the Health and Human Services Committee on Tuesday. Check that out if you're interested. Moving to the House Judiciary Committee on Tuesday here at 1.30 p.m. in the Old State Library. One really great bill being heard. Others that maybe uh, could be of interest to people. Judiciary all, all often deals with, you know, obviously law enforcement issues and uh, criminal penalties. So always very interesting for liberty-minded individuals. But tomorrow on Tuesday, excuse me, Tuesday at 1.30, February 6th, civil forfeiture reform. So this is going to be a good one. Uh, Representative Ken DeGraff and Senator Mark Baisley are definitely two pro-liberty legislators down there at the state capitol. If you're not familiar with civil asset forfeiture, it allows law enforcement, it allows the government to confiscate your property or your money without due process. So this is a new policy that would limit the government's ability, limit law, limit law enforcement's ability to seize your property uh, if you have not been committed of a crime. So I imagine we'll see probably some sheriffs, maybe some police departments showing up in opposition to this bill. Uh, we've seen that in years past. Civil asset forfeiture has been tough to get through, even though it is a bipartisan issue. But, uh, you know, the majority, the Senate or the majority of Democrats are, are pushing this through in the House Judiciary Committee. So it'd be interesting to see if this continues. Uh, one thing interesting you can see here too is the bill sponsors. Looking at the bill text, uh, unfortunately, there's no other bipartisan sponsors on this bill. It's just Representative DeGraff in the House and Senator Baisley in the Senate, both Republicans. So unfortunate to see that there's not been uh, Democrats jumping on this bill who are supposed to be, right? Colorado Democrats are supposed to be in favor of criminal justice reform. So what do you think on this one, Michael? I think we just we need to support this. If you can get down there, that's fantastic. If you can't, I completely understand. At least uh, send out email testimony on this one. I we've been uh, we've been trying for the last few years to get civil asset uh, forfeiture reform in Colorado, and this is a fantastic opportunity for us to actually get it done. So uh, we need to get out there and support these people. Definitely. So in the House Judiciary Committee on Tuesday, these are the people you'd want to be emailing or calling and letting them know that you want them to support this bill. So you can click on the legislative website, leg.colorado.gov, find the House Judiciary Committee, and then you can uh, click, their inf click any of these names. Maybe one of them is your representative or your district of where you live and send them an email, give them a phone call, let them know that they should be supporting and passing the civil asset, civil forfeiture reform 
House Bill 1023. So a yes, a pro-liberty bill 1023. Perfect. Uh, so some other interesting bills being heard, but we'll go ahead and uh, continue on here and move to the House Transportation and Housing Local Com uh, Government Committee at 1.30 on Tuesday. So they've been really trying to push, as the governor you may have seen in his State of the State address, is really trying to push this front-range passenger rail uh, issue. They're trying to get this uh, train system set up here, so they're going to be talking about that. One of the bills being heard related to that on Tuesday. Uh, this is a big bill that is relatively controversial. They want to create this new uh, towing carrier regulation. So if you're able to testify against this bill, uh, it's definitely a bad bill for Liberty. That's House Bill 1051. So they really want to crack down on towing companies and make it harder for towing companies to operate, creating more hurdles and making it harder for people to have cars towed out of their property, unfortunately. So definitely want to check this one out. A quick tip too, if you're looking at a bill online on the state legislative website, and it's so convoluted, right? There's so much legalese and so much different language in here. If you click into the fiscal note, view recent fiscal note on pretty much any bill down at the state on, on the state legislative website, uh, you get a little bit more clear information about what this bill does and obviously the financial impact on it. So clicking into the fiscal note, let's get a better picture of what this bill does. This bill creates new regulations for towing carriers. Well, there's an answer right there that's a bad for liberty, including requiring all towing carriers to submit fingerprint background checks. Oh my gosh. It also increases state revenue and expenditures on expenditures on an ongoing basis beginning in fiscal year 24 to 25. So there you go. This is a uh, fiscal notes are a great way to cut to the chase and tell you what it's going to do. New regulations on towing carriers. Uh, so not a good bill there. What's interesting about it too, a lot of people are really upset about it, especially business owners, is that it creates this new regulation that certain property owners are required to pay for the non-consensual tow removal of a vehicle from their property in the first 30 days of storage. So imagine you own property, you own a business, maybe in downtown Denver, and people are parking uh, there improperly. And you are now maybe on the hook. You might be on the hook for them to be towed. You might have to pay the towing company and you might have to pay for the storage of it. I mean, what's this going to do to small business owners? What's this going to do to residential property owners that have somebody improperly towed on their property? So this is a really bad bill. Of course, going after the towing industry who has had some controversy recently. And um, pretty rough. The towing carriers would be required to notify vehicle owners that they can retrieve their towed vehicle free of charge for the first 30 days following the non-consensual tow from private property. So there you go. Uh, definitely an attack on property rights. Definitely an attack on uh, the rights of business owners. What do you think on this one, Michael? I think it's hilarious. Uh, this is a terrible bill. Imagine how horrible it's going to be to park and go places you want to go. I mean, you park in an area you don't, you're not supposed to. You take up too much time in an area that you're not supposed to on somebody else's private property, and then you don't have, and then you don't have to suffer the consequences. Uh, the uh, the uh, owner, the property owner, is the one that suffers the consequences for for rightfully taking your vehicle off of your lot. Um, it's it's absurd. Of course, and another type of government regulation, a government permitting scheme uh, where, you know, you got to pay the government just to run a business. I mean, it's total unnecessary regulations uh, and absolutely terrible. So if you can, if you're down at the state capitol on Tuesday, uh, definitely consider showing up at the Transportation, Housing and Local Government Committee at 1.30 p.m. at Legislative Service Building A, uh, Room A, uh, Legislative Service Building Room A on February 6th and uh, speak out and to oppose this bill. Reach out to these uh, committee members and tell them that this is a bad bill. So definitely a bad bill on Tuesday. So we're really getting into the thick of things here, this legislative session with all these different bills popping up. 2 p.m. on Tuesday is the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, some different bills here, breast cancer screening fund transfer, physician assistant licensure compact, alcohol beverage delivery and takeout, public employees retirement, Association Retiree Refundable Income Tax Credit. This is a bill, Michael, that we've been tracking, this alcohol beverage delivery and takeout. Definitely a good bill 
uh, finally a good pro-liberty bill that uh, people can support here. So basically making uh, permanent rules for, uh, unfortunately, licensed businesses to be able to sell uh, alcohol for delivery. So you order food from a, a chain restaurant and they serve alcohol, you can get it delivered to your house. So a good bill Tuesday uh, in the finance committee at 2 p.m. Show up there in Senate committee room 357 if you're able to and support this good piece of legislation. You can also reach out to uh, the committee members and tell them to support it as well. Any thoughts on this one, Michael? I, I'm. This is one of the few, just like the civil asset for, uh, forfeiture bill, this is another diamond in the rough, all things considered. Um it's the only good thing that came from COVID was people started to uh, lack some of those uh, alcohol delivery laws for, for a time there. Um, it's one area that uh, Louisiana is better at uh, better than us at. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we got going on on Tuesday. Uh, so Tuesday, uh, the bills of the week here, feel free to take a screenshot of this, anybody, or we can post this somewhere, but the civil forfeiture reform bill, a good bill, alcohol, beverage, delivery, and takeout, another good bill, and then the towing carrier regulation bill, a bad bill. So it's really a packed week so far, looking at Monday and Tuesday. Uh, let's go ahead and jump in over to Wednesday here. So looking at the schedule for Wednesday at the state capitol, uh, lots of committee hearings as well. Uh, the Senate Health and Human Services Committee uh, upon adjournment. There's some behavioral health care, suicide prevention, uh, medicate, medication, continued care. Wasn't planning on necessarily getting into any of those. Moving to the Senate Education Committee at 1.30 p.m. Clarify individualized education program information. Looking at the Senate Judiciary Committee at 1.30 p.m. Confidentiality of group peer support services, monthly residential eviction data, and report. Uh, that one, I think, is mostly a bad bill. It's just creating a new mechanism by which the government's going to be tracking eviction information. So they obviously, there's this big push to get the government to force rent rental companies or property owners to not evict people. And it's just another step in that direction. The child uh, sexual abuse. Yes, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, just a quick reminder for people in the YouTube comments. Um, I see some people are asking where we can get this uh uh, where we could potentially uh, find this information. You can go up here to leg.colorado.gov and then you can go down to the committees and then you can track, uh, then you can click day by day on each committee and uh, see what, uh, who is meeting and what bill is uh, uh, they're, they're going to be discussing for the day. So Wednesday, uh, relatively bad bill, but you know, not obviously the biggest one of the week. Uh, also, Senate commit they're going to do this child sexual abuse accountability amendment. This one did make some headlines. Uh, they want to basically send this to the ballot to Colorado voters, uh, an amendment to the Colorado Constitution concerning allowing Colorado lawmakers to pass laws that permit victims of childhood sexual abuse to bring a civil claim for the sexual abuse, regardless of when it occurred. So, you know, there's statutes of limitations currently on when the sexual abuse uh, lawsuits can can be brought. They want to get rid of that and allow. Um, so, I mean, hard to argue against that, right? Absolutely. I mean, you really feel for these victims. And if justice was never done, that's a horrible thing. But, uh, yeah, I under also understand uh, statute of limitations, too. So that's what's going on Wednesday in the... Uh, uh, Judiciary Committee there. Let's go ahead and look at the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, deceptive Trade Practice Significant Impact Standard, a sunset hearing for the data management service providers, authority of the Attorney General to operate district's attorney office, and prohibiting firefighter personal information on the internet. So some interesting bills if you're interested in any of those topics, but not necessarily planning on getting into any of those, unless you'd like to, Michael. Uh, we don't need to now. Perfect. We'll keep going on. Uh, still a lot to cover here. So Wednesday, 1.30 p.m., the House Transportation, Housing, and Local Government. Railroad safety requirements. Uh, those of you who remember last fall, there was that uh, train crash, that derailment in Pueblo that prevented uh, President Biden from being able to visit there. And there was some uh, talk about new regulations about this railroad safety. Of course, we did see uh, out near Keensburg. Uh, you may have seen that on the news. 
that there was another train uh, derailment as well. So that'll be an interesting bill to keep an eye on. And then construction bidding cost thresholds for Department of Transportation projects. Senate Transportation and Energy Committee at 1.30 on Wednesday. Motorcycle lane filtering and passing. I thought that one was a little bit interesting. Rights of way permits for broadband deployment. Uh, if you're a motorcycle person or involved in motorcycle a law, uh, that one you should definitely take a look at. They want to say when it's okay, when it's not for motorcycles to pass, as if those rules are going to be followed anyway, would be my one thought there. Uh, 1.30 p.m., the House and Health and Human Services Committee. Definitely some interesting bills being heard for people uh, interested in these issues. Child welfare system tools, insurance coverage for provider-administered drugs, modifications to the Child Fatality Prevention Act. But really the most insidious bill that I saw this week on in this committee was the analysis of universal health care payment system. So this bill here, uh, they, they're really trying for years. Voters have rejected it, but of course these legislators still want to continue to push it. And that is a statewide universal health care uh, payment system. So basically they're one step closer to trying to get a, a universal health care system run by the state government. Uh, we can imagine what kind of disaster that would be. Imagine, you know, the DMV for your health care. Uh, so really a bad bill, but it's just showing the plans of these legislators to try and continue to implement this uh, government run health care system. What it, do you it's think on that? It's also important to remember amendment. We had amendment 64, which created uh, uh uh, which legalized and created a regular regulatory system for call uh, for marijuana for recreational marijuana here uh, a couple of years later and four years later they tried to pull amendment 69 which was going to be the Colorado creation of the Colorado care system and that was resoundingly defeated in 2016 uh, at 78% to 21 percent so this is still, a very unpopular idea in Colorado, yet the, just like Ian pointed out earlier with gun control, they don't care. They want to shove it down our throats anyway. So we've got to say, we've got to stand up and say something. 100%. Yeah. I mean, look at this here. The bill requires the Colorado School of Public Health to analyze draft model legislation for implementing a single payer, nonprofit, publicly financed and privately delivered universal health care payment system for Colorado that directly compensates providers. So they're pushing this issue, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, something that needs to be watched, monitored and pushed back on. So that's what's going on Wednesday. Uh, looking at our bills of the week list, that was really the biggest bill that I saw for bad. Uh, moving on to Thursday, we got a lot to talk about here, so let's let's get into it. So going to the legislative website for Thursday, February 8th, lots of committees. I'll be down there at the state capitol on Thursday uh, morning, so if anybody is interested, uh, please let me know, and can, we can show up to some committee hearings. So the Senate Local Government Housing uh, is upon adjournment, Senate Committee Room 352. Bad bill, regulate flavored tobacco products. So, of course, you know, in a state that uh, has been pro-cannabis, pro-legal cannabis, uh, they're still going after tobacco. I mean, tobacco is the boogeyman for lawmakers, unfortunately. So this bill, to remind people, wants to uh, create uh, the ability of a board of county commissioners to go after tobacco products. Let's look at the fiscal note to kind of give us that breakdown of what it does here. The bill allows counties to regulate flavored tobacco products. The bill may impact state and local government revenue and expenditures on an ongoing basis. So under current law, counties may enact ordinances or resolutions to regulate the sale of cigarettes, tobacco products, or nicotine products. The bill expands this authority to allow Board of County Commissioners to also regulate the distribution of these products and prohibit the distribution or sale of the flavored versions of these products. So not just regulate it, but of course that means prohibit it. They want to make it illegal in your community for flavored tobacco products. I mean, absolutely and utterly ridiculous, an overstep of the state government. It is not their responsibility to tell adults that they cannot have flavored tobacco products. Of course, they claim it's for the children. It's always for the children, but nonetheless, this is a bad bill that is infringing on the liberty and the rights of uh, adults. What do you think, Michael? It, it's it's a power. It's it's a power grab. It's another power grab that this uh, legislative uh, year has uh, 
how do I want to say this? I want to say they want to – they've shown no stop whatsoever in terms of trying to grab more and more power from us. They think that they can control us. They think they should have the right to control us in every single aspect of our – Alliance. I mean, I mean, there's another bill that's going that we're going to talk about here in a bit. That's uh, um, scheduled for Thursday. So um, it's absurd. Uh, they they see no area of our lives that they don't think they should regulate, and this is another example. One hundred percent. These legislators are going to be slapping themselves on the back, telling them how talking about how wonderful they are. You know, really shameful. Uh, let's look at that bill sponsors one more time. Really shameful from. Uh, Senator Mullica, Representative Brown, Representative Valesco, Valesco for pushing this idea, uh, pushing this policy that they think they can control our tobacco products. Absolutely terrible. Um, so let's move on there. That was in the um, the Senate Local Government and Housing. That's the first committee upon adjournment. Let's look at the House State Civic and Military Veterans Affairs, the aka the Kill Committee. Uh, an interesting bill, uh, three interesting bills, employer to post veterans benefits availability, compensation for state elected officials. Of course, they want to figure out ways to get more of our tax money and then uh, prohibit foreign ownership of agriculture and natural resources. This is from Bra uh, Representative Brandy Bradley. She's been pretty great down there at the state capitol. This bill is very interesting. Uh, definitely, there's been a lot of national headlines about this type of legislation to prohibit foreign ownership of agriculture and natural resources. Uh, the the kind of the verdict is out in the liberty community. I know Colorado Liberty Scorecard favors this bill because they think national security in this situation could be more important than property rights uh, in certain a certain way, and I can see that. But I can also see from a more uh, straight libertarian perspective that this is a bad bill, right? I mean, people should be able to buy and sell their property to whoever they want. So a very interesting bill, um, really focusing on the People's Republic of China, Russia, or any country determined by the United States Secretary of State to be a state sponsor of terrorism. So, you know, th that they would be banned from buying property uh, in Colorado of certain properties. So I don't know. What do you think on this one, Michael? <laughs> I, I kind of understand both sides as well. I mean, there are some definite problems and there are some definite th threats from all these countries. But at the same time, I think you could also blame our foreign policy for some of the uh, historically for a lot of these threats that we've had. That being said, there's still it's not like we're dealing with good countries either. So, I mean. There's a lot of gray to be discussed from a national security standpoint on that, but I mean, that's not I I don't necessarily know if that's an excuse to strip our property rights or our individual liberty uh, for. Right. Perhaps we could just so, do better as a country. Yeah, interesting bill uh, being heard Thursday down at the state capitol. We've seen uh, federal legislation on this as well. So uh, interesting for people to show up and go over that. That's upon adjournment in Legislative Service Building Meeting Room A on Thursday, uh, as soon as the state legislature or the state house adjourns, excuse me. Let's look at the House Finance Committee here upon adjournment on Thursday as well. State Contribution to Fire and Police Pension Association, Death and Disability Fund, the Social Work Licensor Compact, and the College Textbook Sales uh, Use Tax Exemption. Nothing too exciting there. Uh, unless you wanted to get into any of those. I'm good. So moving on to the Senate Business and Labor and Technology Committee on Thursday. Substance use disorders recovery. Uh, and here's the big one, the big baddie, firearms merchant category co code, basically creating a tracking system in which the state government can tell who is buying firearms, who's buying ammunition, and forcing gun uh, company gun stores and credit card companies basically to go along with this scheme. Uh, of course, another reason to pay cash or crypto, right? If you can figure out a way to do that, but very bad legislation. So be down there Thursday, uh, February 8th. Uh, Ian had mentioned be down there around 915 just to be on the safe side. It's probably a little early, but better safe than sorry. So please show up down there in the business Senate Business Labor and Technology Committee. Senate Finance is also meeting about the same time. Big, big foster home bill. So if you're involved in foster homes, you definitely want to pay attention to that one. Uh, the racial equity study, 
Uh, we talked about that briefly last week, but uh, there's been more information. Of course, they're thinking about uh, potential reparations types of, of things that they might be pushing. So uh, keep an eye on that bill. Keep an eye on what happens with this. Of course, it's just kind of laying the groundwork and creating a, a committee to study this issue and then potentially push uh, a policy agendas in the future. Joint Budget Committee, 1.30 on Thursday, the Senate Health and Services Health and Human Services Committee. Patients' right to provider identification, dentist, dental hygienist, compact, prevention of substance use disorders, and transparency in healthcare coverage. So some interesting bills if you're in that those industries for sure. Did you want to look at any of those, Michael? Uh, not right now. All right, perfect. Moving on to the House Business uh, Affairs and Labor Committee at 1.30 on Thursday. Ex-offenders practice in regulated occupations and wage claims construction industry contractors. And this bill it was a little bit interesting, uh, 1004. Basically, it would just streamline kind of regulations in terms of these regulated occupations where Department of Re Regulatory Affairs, DORA, is already watching them. Um for those industries and when can an ex offender who's now out of jail get to get one of those positions. So uh 1 30 PM house education. Opioid uh, opiate, excuse me, antagonists and detection products in schools. That would basically allow kids to have um anti-opiate type stuff. I'm assuming like Narcan type of things and then detection products so that the kids can detect if there's opiates and whatever they're getting from other kids. Uh, bilingual child care licensing resources, professional endorsement, special education teaching. So that's in the uh, House Education Committee on Thursday. House Energy and Environment at 1.30. Another uh, pretty dumb bill we mentioned briefly, the recycling of single-use electronic smoking devices. So Representative Valdez, of course, is kind of laying the groundwork to go after uh, these single-use electronic smoking devices. We've seen them banned in other places, but that's your vapes. Uh, they want to figure out how they can either get them recycled or possibly even ban them for environmental reasons, of course. House Energy and Environment at 1.30 on Thursday. Oops, we just looked at that one. And then one thirty Senate State Veterans and Military Affairs in the old Supreme Court. Uh, this was a good bill. This one's going to be a good one. So if you're down there Thursday at 1.30, Safety Clause Use Review. From Representative Weinberg and Senator Mark Baisley. So if you don't know, uh, any bill that's passed in the state legislature can have a safety clause at the bottom. Uh, they just write it into the bill. What that does is it makes sure that the bill goes into effect immediately. So if a bill's passed normally in the in the through the General Assembly, it starts the next year, right? So you always see those articles, January 1, these new laws take effect. If there's a safety clause, then the bill takes place immediately. Well, it's pretty much, you know, it, you can understand the reason. Hey, if this is such an important piece of legislation, we need to get it passed immediately. It needs to take effect immediately. But the reality is the safety clause is totally abused. I mean, they're put the safety clause in every, almost every bill that gets passed totally abusing its purpose just so they, they can get either more tax revenue or more regulation sooner than they would by waiting until January 1. So uh, just to read from the bill here, or the bill summary, excuse me, this bill creates a referendum power committee of the House of Representatives and a referendum committee of the Senate committees to review the use of the safety clause on bills. These committees are required to meet during the legislative session to review every bill that is introduced with the safety clause. More specifically, these committees determine whether the use of the safety clause on a bill is appropriate. If one of the committees determines that the use of the safety clause on the bill is not appropriate, the committee is required to replace the safety clause on the bill. So this is just a way to basically create a little bit more, uh, you know, transparency, a little bit more accountability, and really slow down uh, some of these bills being passed. So it is in the Senate uh, kill committee. Uh, it is the right committee if it was going to be passed, but I can imagine that, uh, you know, the legislators, the Democratic supermajority doesn't want to, doesn't want to support a bill like this because it's going to slow down their ability to tax us, create new fees, new regulations. So good bill. Uh, really hope this bill does pass, but I uh, am doubtful. What do you think on this one, Michael? I, I think you're spot on. I mean, Democrats want every single they want every they want to use and abuse every single method they have to enforce their to impose their will on everybody. This isn't one hundred. Yeah, they're gonna. 
I think, yeah, I agree with you. They're going to, they're, I think this one's going to get killed in the quote unquote kill committee. Yes, 100%. So that is what's going on Thursday. Uh, looking at our list here. So some of the big bills there prohibit foreign ownership. That's 1029. Regulate flavored tobacco products, 22. Compensation for state elected officials, 1059. They want to create, you know, get a study out there to get more money. The social work licensure compact. I did want to mention that one briefly, um, specifically because CUT is another great resource out there. So if you if you're not familiar, check out ColoradoTaxpayer.org. It's the Colorado Union of Taxpayers. They track pretty much every piece of legislation heard every year. So if you go to ColoradoTaxpayer.org, you can click here for uh, the 2024 year to date ratings. So they basically give you a link to all the bills they're tracking. So that was Bill 10002. Looking at their uh, website here, they don't like it. They don't like 10002. So we talked about this in previous weeks, saying that this was a good bill to create this social work licensor compact where other people in other states who are already licensed for social work can come here and uh, get a job without going through the hoops of getting a new licensor, license. However, CUT, this is how important this organization is. They're tracking this bill and actually they don't like it. They say they oppose it. The reason is it's unfair and unequitable. It would charge greater license fees to all social workers that would benefit less than half of them. Increased regulations take away the freedom of social workers, plus it assigns some authority to an out-of-state body. So the value of a group like CUT, like the Colorado Union of Taxpayers, is they're tracking this legislation. They send an email every Monday morning. Sign up for their email list if you're not on it. Every Monday morning, they send out an email to every state legislator and the governor, and they open them. The state representatives read these emails and they lay out why these bills are good or bad. So it's really uh, a useful, useful organization, a useful tool. Definitely become a member if you're not. We're so lucky here in Colorado to have great groups like Colorado Union of Taxpayers. You can become a member. I think it's $25. Become a member of Rocky Mount Gun Owners. Support Colorado Liberty Scorecard. Uh, some really great groups out there. And then on Thursday, of course, we have that anti-gun firearms merchant category code bill and then the safety clause used review. So Thursday is a really busy day at the Capitol. You know, we talked a lot this week, as always, about going down there and testifying, providing remote testimony over Zoom, maybe emailing or calling any of the legislators that are in those committees or maybe are your representative to tell them to support or oppose any of these bills. But one thing you can also do is make some noise on social media. You know, these bills, you know when they're going to be heard. You know what's going on down there. Tag the legislators. They're sitting down there at the Capitol on Twitter, uh, you know, and if they're getting beat up, cyber bullied by some good pro-liberty individuals, you know, it might at least cause them to, to think twice, at least on some level. So those are the big bills of the week that we were looking at. Anything to add on this list here, Michael? On this list, no, I got something coming up I'm excited about in another slide or two, though. Perfect. So we always look at uh, some of the bills we've been tracking. Um, we really focus on these calls. If this is your first time on the call, um, they're all li or they're going to be live streamed on YouTube. They're all uploaded to YouTube at Free State Colorado on YouTube. Uh, you can find the playlist of all of these calls. Uh, join and interact with us every week. Get on the live chat on on um, on YouTube there. Uh, but we're looking at we really focus on the bills of the week because we want to empower people to go show up and speak. Right. And know what's going on that week at the state legislature. However, we want to track some bills that maybe aren't heard this week, but we need to be aware of from a liberty perspective. So we've talked previously about the sale of raw milk, a good uh, potentially good food freedom bill. You know, jury's out. Uh, the final form of this bill is going to take. Uh, did pass. It's moving on to the committee and appropriations, but there's not been a new committee data signed for it. So just giving people an update on that. Uh, still floating out there. We'll keep you updated. Another bad bill. Uh, I don't know if Ian mentioned it. Ian did mention this one, uh, an anti-gun bill. No committee hearing date yet, but keep an eye on this. Uh, House Bill 1174 to create concealed carry permits and training. So this is the one where it's going to make it more difficult. They want to make it more difficult for individuals to be able to get their concealed carry permit because of course we know it's the criminals out there who don't get their permits who are the ones committing the crimes individuals who get their carry permit are the least likely to cause any type of legal issue out there so a really egregious bill just attacking the firearm culture and the idea of firearm ownership overall they don't want people carrying firearms they don't want people being able to defend themselves they don't want anybody to have the power of personal responsibility. So we'll keep you updated as this bill gets assigned a committee hearing date. 
Another bill we're tracking, talked about this last week, uh, Senate Bill 65, mobile electronic devices and motor vehicle driving. This is where they want to make in adults, uh, they want to create a new criminal penalty for adults who use their cell phone while they're driving. Of course, this is a, a big money maker. won't actually do anything to save lives or make, make life safer. Uh, just give more reasons for law enforcement to pull people over and get money out of them. So we do have a committee date of February 12th on this one. So we'll talk about that uh, as we get closer to that. Non-legal name changes. This was the biggest bill uh, last week. Blew up all over Twitter. Uh, you know, it was posted everywhere. Uh, lib, libs of TikTok, I think, Twitter account posted this and got a million plus views everywhere because there was a uh, misgendering or some, using somebody's quote unquote dead name down at the Capitol. This was a, a huge bill that got a lot of... Uh, uh, no, excuse me. This is the students one, not the felony one. I'm sorry. But nonetheless, this, there's two bills being heard this year. One for students, letting them change their names without parental permission. Excuse me. Sorry for misspeaking there. And then the one on the felon gender one. But this is the student one of February 15th going to be heard there on Thursday at the House Education Committee. Uh, overdose prevention centers, another bill, not even scheduled a committee hearing yet. House Bill 20, 1028. Uh, we talked about this one. This is the bad bill going up on Monday at one thirty. Another, another. Uh, this one's hit hitting this week as well. Like we talked about the regulate flavored tobacco products. A good bill, a good bill coming up on uh, House Finance on February twelfth, that Monday. Reduction of state income tax rate. Uh, we'll have to see exactly the final form of this bill, but as of right now, it seems pretty good. It would lower our state income tax from four point four to four percent. So we'll keep an eye on that one. Civil forfeiture reform. We talked about that Tuesday. Good bill being heard. Uh, Stephanie Lux, good bill here uh, to publish bill drafts online before the session. So keep an eye on that one. Uh, that one's going on February 22nd, excuse me. On February 20th in the Finance Committee, the Lodging Property Tax Bill Senate Bill 33, this one's going to get a lot of attention, a lot of controversy, because people who own Airbnbs or vacation homes that they rent out would be penalized and would their tax increase would, would quadruple, basically, if this bill passed. So we'll keep an eye on that one as we get closer to February 20th. <laughs> Another big one. Now, I'm sure this is the one you're excited about, Michael. Definitely making yes. the rounds on social media. House Bill 1163 to create a pet animal registration system. What do you want to? What What can you tell us about this one, Michael? Well, this one's just ridiculous. You can see car, towards the bottom of the screen. Okay, so they start off. If you do everything they say, you need to. You will have to pay eight dollars and fifty cents because you own a pet. That's dog, cat, fish. You know, turtle, guinea pig, uh, uh, and there's multiple other uh, uh, pets that are listed in this bill when if you were to open up the bill itself and that's and in order to pay only 850 not only do you have you'll have to have your pet spayed or neutered but you'll also have to have a caregiver assigned so if anything do, uh if anything does happen to your pet or to you or anything like that uh the the state has to have another not only you registered your pet registered but a caregiver registered so that way the state knows who will be the person to um be responsible for your pet if something happens to you or and your family um it's an absolute overstep if you don't have your if you have a caregiver assigned but uh you don't have a pet that's not neutered or spayed it's 16 dollars and uh if you don't have a caregiver assigned, it's $25 annually per pet. And if you don't and if you don't register and they find out, it's a hundred dollars per pet. And if you still refuse, this bill gives the authority of the state to sue you personally for not registering and paying per pet. It's it's oh, and then plus it the bill also gives the uh, Oh, excuse me. The bill also uh, gives uh, the state the ability to uh, dip into the general fund and take as much money as it needs to um, fulfill any additional costs for this pet, this animal registration system. Absolutely and utterly insane. Absolutely crazy. I mean, just the hubris, this, this uh, authoritarian mindset where they want people to register their animals, register them with a designated caregiver. 
and uh, create this animal shelter system of caretakers. All f- the state's going to control it all. I mean, absolutely and utterly ridiculous. Um, total, total garbage type of legislation. Representative Regina English should be shamed, as really ashamed of herself for even pushing something like this. You know, I see people on on social media talking about, you know, homelessness is out of control, crime's out of control, the cost of living's out of control. You know, a lot of people are struggling out here in Colorado. And, you know, Regina English thinks that uh, creating a new pet licensing scheme, registration scheme is is worth the time of our General Assembly at the state capitol. Absolutely not really ridiculous. Regina English should be laughed out of our state. Uh, Jessica in the chat had asked, uh, there was something on this one that increased bond payments also. Uh, I don't know anything about that. I'm not sure if you did, Michael. I, I don't know about, I don't know a ton about the bond payments on this one. That's, that's interesting to me. And then huh. uh, Jimmy did mention that this also includes rats. So, you know, you got some rats, I guess the city of Denver is going to have to register all their rats that they got roaming around down there. Oh yeah. Think about how many people got a bunch of uh, pets after COVID because we had nobody in our lives that we could hang out with because we would get sent to jail for wanting to spend time with other people. Yeah. In the YouTube chat, somebody mentioned homeless pets, right? I mean, like, you know, there's a lot of homeless people out there who have their dogs, have their animals, you know, somebody who's living out on the streets and they have their dog, are you going to tell me that they have to get their animal registered with the state or they're going to have to pay some sort of penalty? I mean, it's just ridiculous. These people it, are not um, worthy of our respect, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely. And think about what the way – with how woke everything – has gotten these days people are now identifying as pets is this going to be is this considered ableist because you cannot identify because you can't as a human being register as a pet (laughs) it's so stupid but i mean it's a it's a question you have to ask (laughs) uh jessica brings up a really good point too she's on the zoom chat here uh you know to get around Tabor. so this bill creates a registration enterprise so they're basically a, an enterprise is a state controlled business. Um, that's how it's not a tax. So if it's a state controlled business that charges a fee, so quote unquote, that's not a tax, and it doesn't. A taxpayer bill of rights doesn't protect the people in that regard. So it's a total scam. Anytime you see that there's a, a enterprise associated, it's really a red flag, something to be uh, something to keep an eye on. So really bad bill. I'd love to see some public outcry. Some people may be showing up down at the state Capitol on Thursday, February 22nd in opposition to this bill um, would be awesome. And one reason, another reason I'm excited about this bill is this is one of those ends for regular people who aren't really concerned about what's going on at the Capitol. You can show them this and they can say, what the hell is going on with our state legislatures, the state legislators, and then show them the other crap that they're doing, because this is going to affect a lot of people that don't care about politics whatsoever. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, pet owners, um, it's part of your family. Right. I mean, and to say you have to have this whole scheme. I mean, it's it's absolutely not really ridiculous. Absolutely. Molinabe, you're not taking my pet. <laughs> Come and take it. Uh, another bill we're tracking is that towing carrier regulation that's being heard this week, Tuesday. Um, so that's what we got. That's really what we got this week. Uh, I'd love to get any feedback, kind of open the floor up. We got Mayor Aaron Lamb of Kingsburg, of course, Jessica, Jody. Uh, Jimmy, Will, any of you on on the in the Zoom want to jump in? Love to have you have some input here. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Uh, I'm I'm a little confused. I, I guess I would disagree with the uh, about the social work bill. Again, I'm very much in favor of the state compact. It makes it a lot easier for licensed people to to move around. So I'd like to look into that a little bit more. I'm not sure exactly how much of that it is increasing the fees. I know, you know, our fees are already high enough for, for all of our state licensure. And in my opinion, we shouldn't have any of that whatsoever. And it should just, the free market should handle it. But uh, yeah, that, that was the big one. And a couple of the other ones just touched on the topic of local control. And I mean, I, I always lean that our local municipalities should have as much control as we can, uh, whether it's regulations, uh, whether it's taxes and, and you know, how the, especially with them trying to push this higher occupancy for all of our small towns and trying to put all these people that they've allowed to come into our country, which 
as uh, if you have been paying attention, the new speak is newcomers. They're, they're no longer migrants. They're no longer immigrants, illegal immigrants. They're newcomers. So I, I think that there's a, a lot there and uh, I oppose most of it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I mean, what are you seeing? Uh, uh, what are you seeing in, in Keensburg related to some of these issues there, Mayor Lamb? Uh, fortunately, very little. Uh, again, when they started shipping the newcomers up into the mountain towns, uh, had a conversation with my town manager. What are we going to do if they try to do that here? Because we are in the same position that we have very little extra resources. Uh, we, we do have a food bank that that happens a weekly or maybe every other week. But as far as extra housing, we really don't have much. So it, it uh, would be a big problem for our town. Let's say uh, I was quite concerned uh, about doing much publicly uh, in the way of ordinances or resolutions so as not to put a target on our back uh, already. Of course, I'm sure you all saw the Kyle Clark hit piece about Kingsburg this week. Uh, so th there already is some of that going on, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's something we're, we are considering. I, I confirmed with our attorney that uh, just the illegals are not being able to vote. Uh, I've heard some rumors that once they get a driver's license in Colorado, they're automatically registered to vote and they don't necessarily look at their citizenship to determine this. Uh, but there's also a, I think, uh, a piece of legislation or uh, ordinance coming out from Monument that is going to be taking a pretty hard stance on this. So I did get a copy of that, a draft. I'm going to have our attorney review it and Keensburg is going to be considering that as well. Um, and, and just to also, I guess, uh, touch on what Ian Escalante said earlier, it, it is right now in Keensburg ordinance strictly prohibited to conceal carry. There is no exception if you have a county issued or state issued conceal carry permit. Uh, my suspicion is that this was crafted well before the state even had a concealed carry system whatsoever. I, I don't have confirmation of that, uh, but our, our board last year unanimously passed a pro second amendment uh, preservation resolution. And when we had Gabe Evans, the representative, of course, uh, he came to our town board meeting two weeks ago, uh, it brought that up and it seemed like we are, are going to be able to go forward with that. I got Ian Escalante involved. Hopefully it'll be an easy W for our MGO and uh, we'll get that fixed for our town. Nice. Uh, hey, Aaron, Aaron, I got a question for you. Sure. I know some people out in Keensburg that are actually working with some churches around here that are doing some stuff for the newcomers or migrants, whatever you want to say. Um, have there been has there been anything inside Keensburg itself from the citizens or pressure on the city uh, or pressure from citizens? To, on the government of uh, Keensburg itself, on specifically you and your city council to do something about that? Not at all. No, I, I mean, again, we're a small town. People don't come to our board meetings, so we don't really get any kind of feedback from the community, much less uh, a pro push in that direction. Uh, again, uh, if I remember our demographics, we're about 30% unaffiliated, 45% Republican, and the rest Democrat, and a very small percentage of us are Libertarians. Uh, yeah. But it's it's not really something that we've got any kind of push from the community. Uh, I, I would suspect, I know which organization you're referring to. Uh, unfortunately, they're dealing with a, a lot of other issues after the ice storm, uh, a lot of flooding and things. So I don't think they've really been making any kind of push <laughs> for that. Oh, yeah. I mean, they they virtue signaled a bunch of people up here. And now all these people from a tropical climate are uh, losing their toes and fingers and stuff because they're not prepared and they're not uh, and they're not adjusted to this type of, of uh, weather. It's not at all. It's yeah, tragic. It's, terrible. It, it's absolutely tragic. What's what's going on? Definitely. We'll really appreciate your input, uh, Mayor Lamb. Keep us updated about. Uh, what's going on in your community. We love love uh, that you're joining us and providing that information. So thank you so much. Anything Happy else you'd to like to here. discuss? Uh, not really. I, I mean, that, that, that was the, the big exciting thing I'm working on, uh, working on a, a few other more minor kind of silly things. Uh, I wouldn't, the train wreck occurred that y'all referred to earlier. I was on just uh, the local news website 
and typed in Keensburg and saw that we are also one of the few towns in Colorado that prohibits children from having snowball fights. It's officially in the ordinance. So that's something else I'm going to be trying to get rid of because that's just ridiculous. Awesome. Well, keep up the good fight, sir. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you hosting this. Have a good night. Definitely. Uh, Jody, uh, you can chime in here. Jody's on our Zoom. Uh, Jody, I know, has been testifying down at the state capitol and in, in speaking in defense of our freedoms. So, Jody, what would you like to talk about? Well, I want to be down there tomorrow. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, at 1.30, um, trying to focus on that HB 24, 1026. And it's really, um, I know that you're saying that it probably won't go because of, you know, we don't carry these votes up there and everything. But what would you think are the most talking points in my limited two minutes? Because I can go on and on and on. <laughs> That you that you can suggest that would be, you know, because I hear that they take this. I heard you talking and I got to listen to you again because you really go fast and I love it. I love this every week. But when you're talking about them hiding or using our taper funds for other reasons, other things that they're hiding and sliding in there, like, you know, this overage of the immigrants and going into that um, these local communities like Lakewood, we have a big one in Lakewood, I'm going to speak at um, using those funds. I thought they couldn't use Tabor funds as at all without our votes for certain things, or are we allowing them to do that? Uh, well, and really anything that takes out of the general fund, any of the reserves is part of our Tabor money. So it really any increased spending is going to hurt that, but, on some level, on some level, but in okay. terms of 1026 specifically, I would say really the big thing down there is that this is providing consent for the taxpayers, consent for the voters. So a lot of communities across Colorado, counties, towns, and special districts have given up their taxpayer bill of rights, their Tabor protections through right. a vote. So Tabor allows the local community to, to vote, the local voters to vote, to give up that Tabor cap on what the government has to give back to the community of what they're allowed to keep of the of the tax revenue. Uh, Tabor prevents them from collecting too much, um, but those local governments can ask the voters to override Tabor for, for any type of reason. So over the years, unfortunately, these local governments have taken away Tabor protections in so many communities. So 1026, if passed, would require these local governments over the next several years to go back to the voters, to ask them once again, can we take your taxpayer money in excess of what Tabor allows? And they'd have to get that consent a second time. So the communities have changed, right? Colorado has been growing a lot. There's been a lot of changes. Some of these special districts in particular, uh, some of those entities that helped create these municipal, these little dist metro districts and stuff don't even exist anymore or not even involved in the community. So it makes sense for these local governments to have to go back to the voters, go back to the taxpayers and ask them to keep more of their money than the constitution allows. Gotcha. So it's really about allowing consent it's really about creating uh, a, a people of the go a government of the people, right? Where the right. people have a say, where the government has to go back to the people and ask for their permission to keep this tax money. Okay. I would say uh, if you go to freestatecolorado.com, the most recent video on there, I did a video with uh, the great Natalie Menton. I know. Uh, I, talk I talked to her the other day about this. And yes, I do watch all your videos with her. <laughs> Oh, I appreciate it. Natalie is one of our rock stars in the pro-liberty yes. movement here in Colorado. But uh, in the video, uh, towards the end, you'll see she actually talks about uh, this bill and kind of provides her input on it. When I do a video, I always try and create chapters. So if you click into the description of it, you okay. can see all these different chapters here. And you can click in directly to that 35-minute uh, mark talking about that bill. And then you know I talk about it. Natalie talks about it. So you can jump right to that. You don't have to watch the whole video. Um, but just kind of wanted to give that resource out there for people. So definitely uh, would love for you to go down there. We'd love to have any input you have oh, yeah. um, from showing up and testifying in support of 1026. But I, really the big thing is the government's supposed to represent the people. The people have changed in Colorado. The demographics have changed. The voting base has changed. It's time we go back to the voters. We ask for their permission to, to exceed the constitutional authority that these local governments have taken over the years. I would say Thank that's you. one of the most compelling arguments. I appreciate you. Thank you. 
And thank you for all you do. Thank you, Jody. Really appreciate it. Uh, who else would like anybody else like to jump in here and talk? Uh, Jessica, would you like to? Um, I was going to say, say um, I'm going to try and get to that Tuesday meeting too in Lakewood. If Jody was going to be down there, that's all I was going to say. Wait a minute. So here's a confusion. There was an, I just saw that posted. It's supposed to be February 12th, the big hearing that everyone's showing up for. Then all of a sudden, yesterday, I see a thing emergency hearing at Lakewood on February 6th. Don't you think they're trying to sneak something in so a lot of us can't show up because they probably know a lot of popularity is going for the February 12th Lakewood meeting? I'm sure. I'm sure it's all sorry like that. No, you're so, I'm sure you're right. That's what that's what they're playing with. And they're they don't know that a lot of us are more organized well, now either. So well, it's taking it away what Brandon's trying to do here with the uh capital. But Brandon, that is a problem right now that's happening. I got a call tomorrow morning and find out what is going on February sixth. Yeah, supposedly uh, just you know, we're not this is beyond the purview of what this call's about, but i but we'll just mention it real quick. Um, because the immigration issue has been such a big vocal issue, just to bring it up, supposedly there's a town hall at the city of Lakewood um talking about turning Lakewood into quote unquote a sanctuary city using vacant Jeffco schools. So they're saying at Dustin Dunstan Middle School, uh Tuesday, February sixth. I don't know that this is associated with the city council. Uh, this might be a group of concerned citizens like we saw in Wheat Ridge, where Wheat Ridge was able to get organized and push back. So this might be trying to preempt the actual city council meeting on the twelfth or so, as you were saying. That's my guess. I do not know and do not have the details, but I'm sure uh, you know, if you're on Twitter, uh, you know, I'll do my best at Free Fall Free State Colorado. And I'm sure Jessica as well, Forest Mommy, uh, can can try and provide any updated information we get so um as, as we get Dun closer to this. That's at Dunstan School. That's not the one down at the uh, um at the um uh, council. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Jessica, would you like to uh, jump in on anything else or, or anybody else? Uh, can I jump in real quick? Definitely. Uh, yeah. Jimmy, what do you what do you have for us this week? Uh, well, I think I th it should just be recognized that uh, it was discussed in the um, House this week that you are no longer allowed to use the word groomer, that it is considered a pejorative under House Rule 23D as uh, I believe it was Representative uh, Weissman was discussing gays against groomers. Um, he was told that he could not use that word. That yeah, was it was actually Representative DeGraff um, was the one who got shut down. I think Weissman was the uh, the chair at the time or the speaker, um, pro whatever, acting speaker. Let me see if I can find that. I know I put on Twitter. I'm sorry, Michael, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I was going to say that's just a civil right. That's a First Amendment violation. And word is that prostitute is also included as a word you may no longer use. It's funny that they did that too because of um, that Tiara's law or whatever. They didn't want anyone bringing up Tiara, the um, trans person who is Tiara's, had like a rap sheet that was like 17 pages long and was a prostitute and all that, whatever. But they didn't want anyone to bring that up which is so interesting. Like it's so, we know what they're doing. It's so, ugh, it drives me nuts. So it took me a minute, but I found uh, the tweet here. So yeah, if you go on, on Free State Colorado or on Twitter, you can find this. So Colorado Representative Weissman, who is the uh, kind of the acting speaker at the time, wouldn't let Representative Ken DeGraff introduce quote, gays against groomers. Wouldn't let him say that because groomers is a pejorative under this house rule. Um, so they don't want us, don't want them to say it. Uh, you know, and, and shutting down Representative DeGraff's ability to represent his community and and use the words he sees fit. So yeah, the a lot of spiciness down at the state house, uh, especially in regards to as Jessica was saying, this Tiara's law. Uh, that's the one that's getting some national attention. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, this is the Bill of Rights for Foster Youth he was talking about on that bill specifically. But yeah, some different opportunities for individuals to go down there and uh, make their voice heard. Uh, hopefully you don't get kicked out of the cap of the committee hearing like the the one lady did, but uh, it's a possibility. If you if you do get kicked out, please let me know. Please reach out to me. I mean, my 
Uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter. Um, Michael K Vance is my is my Twitter handle. Or you can uh, or you can uh, email me legislative director at lpcolorado.org. Perfect. Anything else uh, you'd like to jump in with anybody? Perfect. Well, we went a little long. I really appreciate everybody tuning in. This is on YouTube, so feel free to share it with anybody. Hopefully, uh, come back next week, every Sunday during the legislative session from 7.30 to 9. I think we're going to try and get more guests to come in. Um, maybe that first half hour, Michael, we can, res just thinking out loud, we can reserve for a guest speaker if there is one. Oh. Uh, so 7.30 to 8. And then we could always jump into our regular kind of going through the, the committee hearings of the week. And But we could see. Absolutely. I thought it was great having Ian on with us tonight. Definitely. So on YouTube, share this video out. Um, you know, this is going to be a big week down at the state capitol. Hopefully we can get some pro-liberty activists, some people out there speaking in defense of our rights and our property, and hopefully speaking against the authoritarianism, uh, looking these legislators in the eye and telling them they're wrong. So perfect. Well, thank you everybody for your time. Best wishes, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good night.